Hello, this talk is called uh, The Uniqueness of Man, and I'm going to give evidence for intelligent design and special creation. Um, I actually wrote a book in 2004 called The Design and Origin of Man, and later in 2008, I wrote the booklet in God's Image, which is like a shorter version explaining the evidence for intelligent design and special creation. By the way, that booklet has been translated uh, into Spanish and also into French, as you can see there. But I just want to explain my own personal interest uh, in this subject of the design and uniqueness of man. I do various uh, aspects of biomedical research at my university. I've worked mostly on the knee joint, uh, but also on the design of the hands, the feet, uh, and the jaw amongst other areas. And most of the examples I'll give in this talk actually relate to my own research and my own experience in the lab. I've also worked with Team GB on Olympic bike design, and I've studied some of the biomechanics of cycling. And if you ever study the biomechanics of an Olympic cyclist, it's pretty astounding. So that's been uh, really fascinating and, and relevant to this talk. And even my work on spacecraft design is relevant to this talk because I've been doing a little bit of a comparison between the wiring on a spacecraft, which is very complicated, and comparing that with the wiring in the human body, the nervous system, which is even more complicated. Uh, and I'll mention something about that uh, a bit later. So this relates to my own interest in this uh, subject. Now, right at the start, uh, it's good to to, to make the point that there is a scientific controversy when it comes to the origin of, of humankind. We have this claim, we often hear in the media and in education, claim that humans have evolved from an ape-like ancestor. But it is a fact that it's controversial. It, it's controversial in, in academia. Many scientists uh, are not at all convinced that humans have actually come from an ape-like ancestor in our schools and universities they show this kind of picture you can see here one of these monkey to man charts this was one of the first uh, in a book called march of progress published in 1965 and many children and university students are told this is a fact uh, but actually it's a controversial theory and i'll just give a couple of examples to illustrate that point this is one admission by, by an evolutionist, and he said this, there is a popular image of human evolution, a succession of figures that become ever more like humans. It, it is an illusion. That's a very honest statement by him. What he's saying is, these diagrams are not based on scientific facts. Uh, it's someone's assumption and someone's conjecture. And just to give you one more example of an admission, uh, this, this academic, who's an evolutionist, he, he said this, we have all seen the canonical parade of apes. We know that as a depiction of human evolution, this lineup is Tosh. So there you are, another admission that this diagram, these kind of diagrams, are not based on scientific fact, but on someone's imagination. But unfortunately, children and students are not told that when they are presented with this picture. So there is a scientific controversy. So what I'm going to do in this talk is to give the evidence for intelligent design. And it falls into two main categories. One is that there are many major anatomical differences between humans and um, apes. By apes, I mean modern apes and extinct apes. Um, but as well as those major differences that make humans unique, Humans are also purposefully over-designed. And what I mean by that is our brains are far more clever and powerful than they need to be to survive. Our hands, likewise, are far more skillful than they need to be to, to survive. And from head to toe, humans are purposefully over-designed. And that's really significant because here is a really... Uh, important statement by an evolutionist, Professor Stephen Jones, and he said this, 
evolution does its job as well as it needs to and no more. A really important principle of evolution is that it cannot produce something, anything more than is needed to survive. And it's a great admission because what that means is, according to evolution, humans should have no aspect of design that is more than necessary to survive. Our brain should be no better than they need to be to survive, our hands likewise. And this is one of the reasons so many scientists find it hard to believe in evolution because humans are clearly over-designed from head to toe in a purposeful, positive uh, way. So I'll refer to the, both of those things during this talk. Now, why is this uh, so important? Well, it's much more than just an intellectual uh, debate. It, it's really important because it affects our worldview. So if you believe in evolution, uh, if you have an atheistic worldview, or in fact, any evolutionary worldview, you then have to believe every part of our body has come about through a process of evolution. So just to give you an example of our hands, our hands, according to evolution, have evolved to punch, to club, and to rape. And at the bottom of that diagram, you can see a couple of references to uh, papers where academics have explained uh, why it is evolution would have produced hands that could punch club and and rape by the way that's not a very good thing to teach children just before they go to the playground in a in a school that their hands are for punching um, but look at the contrast it was a biblical worldview uh, that argues that hands are designed for skill for things like playing the piano if god has created man the ability to play musical instruments is exactly what you would expect but according to evolution we have not evolved to play musical instrument it's just a coincidence that we happen to be able to play musical instruments uh, today and so we have to ask the question if you look at the design of hands and brains and other parts of the human body does it look as though we are designed for skill or does it look as though we're designed to punch, club and rape? Uh, and, and we'll be looking at the answer to that question during the talk. So it, it's an important uh, topic in question. So what we're going to do is look at five unique uh, design features of humans. Um, in my book and booklet, I go through about 10. Uh, but we're going to just look at five during this talk. So the first one is skillful hands. I've been involved in designing robotic uh, exoskeletons. Uh, there's a picture of one there and a reference to a paper I've written. And uh, th these exoskeletons have medical applications. We use this one to help a stroke patient to strengthen their hands so they could do uh, more activities in the home. And one of the things that I learned doing this project, it was a very humbling lesson, was that the human hand is a marvel of design. It's an incredible uh, design. We could not come close to matching the performance of the human hand. The human hand is so different to a hands it's like chalk and cheese an ape hand is designed for strength they're very powerful and they're curved for hanging on a branch you can see how different it looks to a human hand the human hand is delicate slim uh, it can go from a flat hand to a clenched fist and hence make many shapes in between and it can go through many and, and make many distinct movements um, some researchers have said there are about 58 different distinct movements in the human hand. And this slide illustrates some of the uh, unique um, features of the human hand. The human hand can make a pinch grip between the thumb and each one of the fingers. Apes can't do that. That's one of the secrets to the skill of the human hand, this ability to hold things with precision uh, in a pinch grip. The human hand can also make a tripod grip, you can see on the right, holding 
a pen, the middle finger, index finger and thumb, neatly come to an exact point to hold uh, a pen or other instrument. And the bottom pictures show how the human hands can make multiple grips to do some very complicated things like crochet. I think crochet is an amazing thing. I can't do that, uh, but very impressed by people who can. Um, but here you can see some of the skillful things that a human hand can do. And the reason human hands are so skillful is because of a highly integrated system, 27 bones and ligaments, 35 muscles and tendons. The tendons are the part that join the muscles to the bones. Uh, then there are countless blood vessels, nerves, and then there's this fine skin full of sensors to make the hands very sensitive and skillful. So an engineer looks at these kind of pictures and an engineer says, how is it possible to pack so much technology into a hand that can do these incredible things? But first of all, I just want to give you an idea of the performance of the human hand. Just five examples. The human hand can make such a gentle pinch grip that it can hold one milligram grain of sand. That's a thousandth of a gram. Our pinch grip is so delicate, we can pick up tiny, delicate uh, objects. Uh, as I said, uh, humans can hold uh, a pen like a pinch grip. Very hard for evolution to explain why we can why is it we can hold a pen that's exactly what you'd expect if god had created man but hard to explain by evolution and the same with playing musical instruments like the piano our hands have fast switch muscles so a pianist can play more than 15 notes per per second and hence play very complicated beautiful music and our fingertips have something like 2000 touch sensors which means we can feel a ridge just 13 nanometers in size that is a very very small distance again it's exactly what you'd expect if god had designed us to have very very delicate uh, skin and we also have fine movement control uh, we can move our, our various fingers in different positions with a resolution of about 1.1 millimeters, uh, which means we can move our fingers in a very precise way and there are billions of permutations of positions for our fingers and hands. So how is it that the human uh, being can do these incredible things with their hands? What is the technology in our hand? Well, it's very difficult to explain, but I'm going to attempt to do that in the next few slides. First of all, this one shows uh, a, a picture of one finger. So this might be the index finger, for example. And I want to try and explain how each one of our fingers has a precision cable system. Uh, uh, most of our fingers have six cables which produce uh, three main movements. At the bottom, you can see that the list of the six cables, there are four tendon cables, and there are two muscle cables. And these are just incredibly well designed. Uh, one of the amazing features of human fingers is that we can move our finger around the main knuckle joint at A, you can see that on the left, but as well as that, we can move our finger around joint B, the next one up from the knuckle. Uh, in fact, you could try this yourself. You can move your finger like this around the bottom joint, but you can also do a trigger movement by moving your finger around joint B. Now that is a very complicated thing to do from a mechanical point of view. To do that, we need four tendons. We need the two extensor tendons on the top in light blue and light green. And we need the two flexor tendons on the bottom in dark blue and dark green. And it's a brilliant design because of those four tendons, depending on which tendons are actuated by a muscle made tight, 
depending on exactly which ones are tight, that determines which joint the finger will bend around. Now, of course, we don't think about what we're doing, but our brains have uh, learned which muscles to pull in order to do this complicated movement. So the reason behind the skill of the human hands to play musical instruments, to do lots of different movements with the hands, is this ability to move our fingers around different joints. And that is possible because of this amazing uh, precision cable system. You can notice on the right, our fingers can also move side to side uh, because of the, uh, what are called the interossi muscles. That, uh, so our fingers can move up and down and side to side. But as I say, the really clever thing is that they can, you can move your finger around different uh, joints. It's an incredible design. When an engineer looks at this picture, an engineer thinks, well, hang on, how can you have four tendons? Because on the top, how can you have two tendons? Surely that's an impossible design. And on the bottom, there are two tendons. Surely that's an impossible design. Well, I'll show you how the human hand does this. On the left is a picture from Gray's Anatomy. And what you can see is how we have both a short extensor tendon and a long extensor tendon. If you look at this diagram, uh, I can use my cursor here. Look here how this tendon splits and the middle part becomes the short tendon and the outer part splits and become the long tendon. This is what I call an outrageously brilliant design. Uh, it must have been an intelligently specified design. In fact, William Paley in 1802, in his famous book, Natural Theology, where he argued for intelligent design, he refers to this very example of this amazing split tendon. That has to be specified design. It could not come about by chance. But this diagram is also helpful because at the bottom you can see how the muscles are in the forearm. It's amazing how the muscles for the fingers are actually in the forearm. And if you follow these muscles, you can follow a line all the way up to these tendons, all the way up to the finger. Now you might ask the question, why are the muscles in the forearm for the fingers? The reason is so that the fingers and also the hands, but especially the fingers can be very slim. By not having muscles in our fingers, our fingers can be delicate, slim and skillful. But what that means is you need this precision cable system to join the tendons in the fingers with the muscles in the forearm. And this is a little bit like you have on a bicycle cable system. On the right, you can see the rear wheel of a bicycle with the yellow cable system, cable going into the gears. And on a bicycle, what you have is you have the levers on the handlebars, so you pull on the handlebars, and that force is transferred via a cable all the way down to the gear. But that's only possible because it's a precision cable system with guides and various other um, aspects. And, but that is what you have with the human hand. You have a precision cable system, far better than any engineered cable system. So these are the tendons on the back of the hand. But now I'll show you the tendons on the palm of the hand. And in this case, you actually have two sets of tendons, not a, a split one like uh, on the back of the hand. So you have the short flexor tendon, but then you also have a long flexor tendon. The short one is split, but it's not part of the same tendon as the long flexor tendon. But again, you have this very clever splitting uh, system. But this particular picture from Gray's Anatomy, it shows us something also remarkable about the design of the fingers. Because you have a sheath, you can see this up on the top left, this sheath covering the tendon to protect it and to guide it. If you look carefully at this sheath, you can see a couple of crosses. There's a cross here and a cross here. 
Now, why does the sheath have this special feature near the joints of this uh, cross fibrous design? The reason is that it's a little bit more flexible and it allows the finger to move. That's a, a, a brilliant detail of design, again, showing surely intelligent design. The fingers also have these guide tunnels with synovial fluid. So the tendons move uh, with ease and don't get uh, caught with high friction. So it's a brilliant design. And some of the features, again, you can see on the bicycle system. If you look at the gold colored cable, it's segmented so that it can, it can flex and turn. And you have these, uh, you, you can see where the, the cable enters uh, and you have guides and tunnels. So, but in the same way that a, a, an engineered cable system is designed, surely the cable system in the hand is designed. And what is in the hand is, is far superior than anything engineers have designed. But now we come to a second unique design feature in human beings. And that is the unique upright stature. Now this is actually connected with unique hands because, because humans have this upright stature, it means we don't walk on our hands like every other mammal. There are about 4,000 mammals. Humans are the only mammals that walk on two legs. That means our hands are free for skillful tasks. So there's a connection there. But in this section, we'll look at the unique upright design of humans. Uh, my own interest in this is researching the human knee joint. Uh, it's one of my publications there and one of the things that I've studied is the ability of the human knee joints to be upright and to lock in an upright uh, position. But it's worthwhile just comparing the anatomy of apes uh, or extinct apes and the anatomy of humans because apes are very well designed to walk on four limbs um, and their design is is perfect for that but humans are designed to walk upright and there are many features that relate to the upright stature of humans from head to toe there are various important features we have vertical balance in our ears uh, we have a flat face to see the ground in front of us and if you look at all the joints in the human body, from the S-shaped spine to all of the joints through the various uh, parts of the body, the legs um, and the back, they are all upright joints for upright stature. What this means is you can't gradually evolve from a four-legged creature to a two-legged creature. Um, if you started to change, you would be good for neither. You'd need so many hundreds of changes. They have to be there in one in one go. Um, so humans must have this unique origin. Now of all of these features, the one I'll just go into a few details about are the feet. Um, as well as having unique hands, humans also have unique feet. You may not think uh, it's a particularly important part of your body, but from a mechanical point of view, it's a very beautiful part of your body. And like the hands, uh, you can see such a difference between an ape foot and a human foot because an ape foot is really like a hand because apes really need four hands for their climbing through trees. So you can see on the left, uh, the ape has, you know, look, look at the toe of the ape. It's like a thumb. It's not like the big toe of a human. And uh, the human ape is it does not have the arch structure that a human foot has. You can see on the diagram on the right, uh, the arch structure of the human foot even has a keystone at the top, that top bone. Because of that arch structure, it means we can feel the ground at the back, the heel, and also the front, the sole. And it's because of that arch, that's why humans find it so easy to stand. We get our balance so easily because we can put the center of gravity through those two points. Apes can't do that because they don't have an arch. That's why it's so difficult for an ape uh, to stand up. Uh, just like a man-made arch, uh, 
any kind of arch cannot evolve step by step. It's an irreducible structure. The whole sh arch structure has to be there from the beginning. Uh, the big toe is also important. Uh, it gives strength to the foot. It points forwards, which enables humans to run and to walk. Uh, only humans can run on two legs. Apes can't run on, on two legs. They can try to walk, but in a very clumsy way. A remarkable feature of the human foot is that it is it can be both stiff and flexible. It, it's an amazing design. Just to say one more thing about the feet is that in fact the human foot has three points of contact two at the front and one at the back so you have this little arch between the two contact points at the front this means that humans can stand on one leg by putting the center of gravity between those three points apes cannot do that but what this means is that uh, it's an ideal design for two-legged running and walking Humans are good at sport, they can stand on their feet, uh, they can twist and turn, uh, but apes can't do that. They can't stand on their feet, they can't play any kind of sport uh, like that. I think this god is this shows not just that there is an intelligent designer, but that God has designed humans to enjoy all kinds of activities, sport activities and work uh, activities, that the human foot is a wonderful design and by the way when looking at old fossils it's normally if, if you can just look at the feet you can tell whether a fossil is it's human or ape um, because there's nothing between a human foot and an ape foot just to mention one more thing about the knee joint because this relates to my research one of the amazing things about the knee joint it has what's called a four bar mechanism it's actually an inverted uh, parallelogram four bar mechanism uh, which is an irreducible mechanism by the way you can't evolve it step by step another uh, evidence for intelligent design but one of the really clever things about the four bar mechanism in the knee is that it has a moving center of rotation that's why I've got those letters there C-O-R moving center of rotation what that means is the if you're bending your lower leg you can bring your lower leg right up. It gives it a complete uh, 180 degree range of motion. That's possible because of the four bar mechanism. It's a brilliant uh, piece of design. And but with humans, only humans can have uh, upright locking of their knee joint, uh, which is very convenient for, for standing. But then we come to a third unique design feature of humans, and that's unique facial expressions. My interest in this particular feature comes from some research on artificial muscles. This is uh, an important area of research at the moment because in engineering, we haven't had many kinds of actuators with a, uh, a large strain, uh, but in the human body, muscles are an excellent example of a large strain actuator. And so in the last decade or so, engineers have been very keen to try and produce artificial muscles. And I've done some work on this and published uh, some papers. So um, I have a particular insight into what muscles can do and very impressed by what muscles can do. But facial expressions are a very important part of human design because facial expressions enable us to communicate emotions very quickly. Sometimes uh, using words is clumsy for uh, communicating our fear or joy. Sometimes the fastest best way to communicate is through a facial uh, expression and a couple of examples uh, here. It's interesting that humans have a physical design that complements our emotional design and facial expressions a really good example of that if you look under the skin of an ape's face you see around 26 facial muscles for opening and closing the mouth opening and closing the eyes but none of them are, are, are for facial expressions but in the case of humans we have about 50 facial muscles and 
around 24 of those are dedicated to making facial expressions. So on this diagram on the right, if you look around the mouth, you can see these delicate little muscles, one here, one here, very delicate muscles here. And some of these delicate muscles are there just for facial expressions. The ones above the lip, most of them are to do with smiling. Um, uh, there's no survival. It's difficult to find a survival advantage for, for smiling and recognizing a smile. But, but that's exactly what you'd expect. If God had designed man and created man, you would expect God would want us to express emotions like smiling. And there's evidence of overdesign with facial expressions. If we had evolved by process of evolution, by chance, you would only expect us to make a handful of facial expressions, a couple of smiles, a couple of frowns, because that's all you need to survive. But if God had created man, you would expect God to give us an abundance of things. The Bible talks of God giving in abundance. And researchers have analyzed how many expressions humans can make. And it is something like 10,000. Just what you'd expect if God had designed man. Uh, I, when my youngest son was very young, he was only about five years old, and I asked him, if he could give a range of facial expressions. And these are the expressions he gave. All of them are just acting, even the ones where he looks worried. Uh, he, he was obviously a very good actor at the age of five, but it's remarkable that at the age of five, the human brain is able to control those many muscles in the face to deliberately produce types of facial expression. Uh, it's just astonishing that even a young child can learn those things. And so it gives you an idea of how many expressions the human face can make. Another evidence of overdesign in, in the human uh, face is the whites of the eyes. Now, why is this so? Well, humans are unique in that you can see the sclerata, the whites of the eyes. You, you see that on the left and on the bottom. But if you look at the ape, uh, you cannot see the whites of the eyes. And if you look at a pet dog or other animals in creation, you don't see the whites of the eyes. Now, that's to be expected because when predators are looking out for the prey, they look out for the head, the eyes. And so as a type of camouflage, it makes sense that God would give the animals camouflaged eyes um, and you not being able to see the whites of their, their eyes. But, so then why does it make sense that God would make humans different and make the whites of our eyes visible? Was well, a very clear reason for that. Uh, humans like to see the direction of gaze. When we're talking in a room or a hall or anywhere, we want to know if someone's looking at us. And because God wants us to be good at communicating, he gave us that uh, feature of seeing the whites of the eyes. In the secular world, scientists are very puzzled why humans are so different with the whites of the eyes but creationists have a clear answer to that question it makes sense from a biblical world view but then we come to unique language and speech the reason for my interest in this particular feature is i have worked on the human jaw which is uh, an another amazing part of the human body very powerful very sophisticated um, but what I want to focus on is unique language and speech. Humans have up to a million words in various languages, it's around a million possible words in the English language. Apes have hardly any words in their language if, if, if any at all and so this again shows you a complete contrast between what apes can do and what humans can do. There isn't a tiny difference between apes and humans. There's the world of difference between them. Uh, people have pointed out if humans were hunter-gatherers, surely they wouldn't speak so much. Humans speak a lot. Uh, exactly what you'd expect if God had created us to be communicating beings, not what you'd expect if we were uh, hunters, 
What's particularly interesting is that the average woman speaks twice as much as the average man. Lots of people have suspected that uh, for a long time. But as I point out to my male friends who feel a bit smug, this also means that uh, women are twice as over-designed as man in that particular respect, because talking is a good thing. But the ability to speak, it's really an amazing, it, it's a miracle of mechanical design. We have these vocal folds that vibrate to produce a very pure sound, then we have a deep throat to resonance, the depth of our throat, very similar to the length of our mouth, it gives resonance. We have an agile tongue. On the two diagrams on the right, you see how the tongue makes different positions. Depending on the position of the tongue, we have a different shape of the vocal tract and it produces a different sound. We have fine lips to release pressure suddenly for p and b. And so we can release pressure in the right way. A lot of these things we don't think about, but they're very skillful things. And we have dozens of muscles throughout the vocal tract to change the shape of our mouth, our throat, to uh, change the sound. And our brain is, is an amazing computer system for processing uh, sounds, the way we hear, the way we speak. And that is certainly not fully understood yet by scientists. And as an evidence of overdesign, I think a, a lovely example of overdesign is the ability of humans to sing with great beauty. How does evolution uh, argue that we could only survive if we could sing with great beauty? But this is what you'd expect. If God had designed us to know him, to sing praises to him, that's one of the most wonderful, beautiful things that we can do is to know God and to sing praises uh, to him. People have studied the human voice and found it uh, to, to be very pure, very beautiful from an acoustic point of view. And then we come to a unique brain. Uh, this must be one of the most, surely the most impressive parts of the human body although one of the hardest to explain because it is so beyond our comprehension. But just to mention a few things, uh, the human brain has a unique motor cortex. This is the part of the brain that controls the muscles in the body. One really interesting feature of the unique motor cortex is that 25% of that whole area is dedicated to the facial muscles and 25% of that area is dedicated to the muscles of the hands. That's really fascinating. That shows that God has given us the computer hardware and software to control our, our hands, our fingers, and our face. And what that shows is that we really are designed to be skillful with our hands, not just with our hands themselves, but with our, with our brain. And also God wants us to use these facial expressions in communication. Um, I don't know whether you can hear on this video, but my neighbor is a brilliant classical pianist and uh, I can hear that music coming through the walls. So uh, an example of the skill of human hands. How about if we try and compare the human brain with a supercomputer built by humans? In November 2018, I think it was IBM, produced a world record supercomputer. They called it Summit, and it is a truly astounding supercomputer. It can do the most amazing calculations. But let's compare that Summit supercomputer with the human brain. Well, the Summit supercomputer has a volume of a million cubic centimeters. That is a thousand times greater than one human brain. But how powerful are those two computer systems? It turns out that even this Summit supercomputer is less powerful than one human brain, even though it's a thousand times bigger. Because the human brain, it's been estimated, can do a billion billion calculations per second. All the things going on in the body the Summit supercomputer can only do 0.2 billion billion, even though it's a thousand times bigger. 
But then look at the next line. The human brain requires just 20 watts of power to run. Look at how that compares with the summit supercomputer that requires 13 million watts, almost a million times more than the human brain. That just shows you how incredibly efficient the human brain is. Now the summit computer had some amazing designers. Surely the human brain must have a designer infinite in wisdom and power. Having described five unique design features of the, of the human body, I just want to mention a really important thing, and that is the most important difference between humans and animals. Humans have a unique soul. We are spiritual beings made in the image of God. We're not just animals. We have a unique mind. We have awareness of self and rational thought. I have a pet dog. Uh, in, a, in, in another room, it's a little chihuahua, it's very clever, but it doesn't have awareness of self. It doesn't wonder if it's the best looked after chihuahua in the whole of Bristol. It doesn't think like we think. Humans have unique emotions and appreciation of beauty. My chihuahua doesn't stop to look at a sunset. Uh, he's just interested in, in food and, uh, and, and things like that. Humans have unique powers of choice. Every second where we have a choice of what to think, what to do, what to say. We can be very creative. Um, animals follow their instinct. They're very predictable. Even my chihuahua, who's, who, who's had the training of home, he's very predictable. Uh, he doesn't really have true powers of choice. But it's because of humans' powers of choice, the Bible explains, that we are all sinners because many of the choices we make are not right in God's sight. In particular, we don't serve God as we should. Uh, because God is our creator, we should uh, love God with our whole heart. We should serve God every day. We should always remember God. And that is something none of us do. And if we're not Christians, we certainly uh, do not respect God and love God as we should do. Many of our choices are sinful because of that and that relates to our conscience uh, all of us have a moral awareness and a conscience and and we have a conscience if uh, if we don't love god with our whole heart and we don't love our neighbor with our whole heart but this is where the gospel comes in good news of the bible is that god has made a way for us to be forgiven a way for us to have a knowledge of God and relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, God's son, who God sent into the world to live in this world, a perfect life, and then to die on the cross for our sins. And if we believe in him, not only will his righteousness make us righteous before God, but if we repent of our sins truly and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins will be forgiven. God gives us his Holy Spirit, and then we come to know God and then we become uh, a, a person doing things that we were truly designed to do. We are really designed to know God and to enjoy him. Otherwise, life is just not the same. Apart from the fact that if we know God, we have that important hope of heaven, eternity with God. That's the most important uh, thing we can ever learn in our life. So what does science show? It shows that humans are special. We, we read in the Psalm, that you have made him a little lower than the angels. Today, children are taught in schools that they're a little above the beasts. They're, they're just a type of ape, a little above the beasts, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches we are made a little lower than the angels and the scientific evidence supports that when you consider the amazing design of humans. That psalm, that verse goes on to say, you have crowned him with glory and honour. If we know God, if we know the Bible, uh, if we know the joy of being in God's family, we are crowned with glory and honour. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a joyous thing. It's a very positive, 
joyous verse and any Christian will tell you it's true and you can experience that if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll just go through a Q&A as quickly as I can because people have many uh, questions to do with design and the human body. What about disease and deformity? Firstly, God made a perfect world in the beginning. God didn't create arthritis and diseases at the beginning of creation. Disease and deformity came in at the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. They rebelled, they sinned. There was a curse on creation. That's when disease and deformity came. So arthritis is not due to a bad design. It's due to the curse. Uh, disease and design are two kind of different uh, things. We can still say the human body is wonderfully designed despite the fact that there is disease. People ask about the eye. They say, is it wired backwards? That's what Richard Dawkins has claimed. He says that this light goes through the eye because it has to go through the retina, you can see on the diagram, to get to the light sensitive cells at the back, surely light degrades and that means it's a bad design. Well, Dawkins has made a big mistake with that claim because scientists have discovered Muller cells, which are like optical fibers, and light is funneled through those fibers to the light sensitive cells at the back of the retina. So the light is not degraded as Dawkins thought. In fact, it even does signal conditioning, things like blocking out reflected light. So it's actually a brilliant design feature. What Dawkins thought was a bad design feature wasn't at all. Just to mention one other thing about the eye, um, an amazing precision design feature. Um, we have the sphincter muscles. If you look carefully, uh, just outside the pupil, you can see dozens of these tiny precision sphincter muscles. They reduce the pupil size in bright light, but on the outside of the iris, you see these dilator muscles. They open the pupil in dark light, a piece of precision engineering. Engineers cannot build a camera as small as the human eye because they can't do that kind of brilliant design. People have asked about the human back. Is it a bad design? A lot of people suffer from a bad back. But actually, um, if you don't have disease, if you don't have illness, if you look after your back, you find it's actually a brilliant uh, design. At Southampton University, they are actually studying the, the, the human back, the vertebrae, uh, because it's considered such a brilliant design by engineers. They want to implement some of the features into bridges to make better engineered systems because vertebrae are wonderful the way they fit together, very flexible and yet very, very strong. So if you put disease, um, and misuse to one side, the back is actually a, a brilliant design. Then people are asked about the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And I want to explain why that is not a bad design. If you haven't heard of this one, it relates to the larynx. You can see this blue voice box here. You can see how there are two nerves that go to it. One is the one in red, the superior laryngeal nerve. But then there's one that loops right down, right down to the heart and back up. So it's called the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now you may have heard Richard Dawkins say, this uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve is obviously a ridiculous detour. He thinks it shouldn't go this long way. Even though the nerve works perfectly fine, he thinks it's not a good design. And Jerry Coyne has said, this is one of nature's worst design. So he thinks this is a classic example of bad design. But I'll just explain why it is not a bad design. And I'll start saying the best wire routes often have loops. Engineers know this. And if you look inside a car or in a building, um, very often wiring has loops. What you don't want to do with the wiring system is everything is, is tight. Um, and if, uh, if Dawkins and others had just come to some basic engineering lectures, they wouldn't make this kind of uh, mistake. But I just want to show you some wiring on a spacecraft I designed. This is on the Envisat uh, spacecraft. And on this spacecraft, I had to do the wiring from the solar array back to the spacecraft, I had about 300 wires. 
you can see in this top left diagram, I have a double loop. There are two loops. Uh, interestingly, they're actually similar in size and design to the loop on the laryngeal nerve. I didn't know this until afterwards, uh, but that's how I designed it. And I've designed this for very similar reasons as to why humans have a looped laryngeal nerve. I had intermediate connections to make. If I just use the cursor, you can see a blue wire here and a red wire here. One is to a thermocouple, one is to a position sensor. I needed to piggyback those two little wires onto a bigger wire. So I piggybacked them on top of the power wires from the solar array. I also needed redundancy, very important on a spacecraft, in case one set doesn't work, there's a, another set of wires on the other side. It also allows motion to have a, a loop, it's not so tight. And there are also assembly constraints. I have to think of how the technicians are going to assemble this whole system. I have to take it into account. They've got to plug things and bend things. I have to think there must be enough slack for them to assemble. Now, interestingly, all four of those uh, design objectives I can see with the human laryngeal nerve. For example, notice there are two intermediate connections, one to the trachea, one to the esophagus, just like my spacecraft wire. And those intermediate connections, the wires for those would have been very tiny and they needed to piggyback on something else. So that's one reason why the recurrent laryngeal nerve would make sense. There's also a degree of redundancy because the two main nerves, the superior, the recurrent, come from different directions. There have been soldiers shot in one place in the throat. They still have the ability to speak because of this redundant feature. The fact that you have the recurrent nerve means there's more flexibility than there otherwise would be. But very importantly, with humans, you have assembly constraints. The baby grows, the organs move apart, and if all, the, if all the wiring, the nerves, is too tight, those organs couldn't move apart. So it's not surprising that we see some looping in the nerves in the human body. So this is an example where if you look deeply at the engineering of the human body, you begin to see reasons for things that at first may not have made complete sense. There's also the lesson. It's important not to make knee-jerk reactions about why something is designed, especially considering the intricacies of the human body. I'll just mention something about the human throat. Some evolutionists, and this has happened in the last few weeks, um, have claimed that the throat is a bad design because of the risk of choking on food, because we have the same opening for food and air. And surely we should have a, bl a blowhole like a whale, you know, that would be better to have separate breathing and eating. Well, the answer is a healthy throat works very well. It's another brilliant design. Yes, we have to be a little bit careful, but in life you have to be careful with everything. Um, it doesn't take too much uh, care and attention to have a healthy throat, even a baby. Uh, doesn't naturally choke. And by the way, a blowhole is good for a well, but it's not good for a human. Why would a human want a hole on its back, breathing through that and um, having their mouth at the front? Uh, to say God should have designed things a different way uh, is, is not a good idea and it doesn't work. Just to make the point at the bottom, multi-objective design involves a trade-off. Um, that's uh, something I'll be giving some talks more on in the summer, but that's at the heart of this kind of um, question and answer. I think there are a couple more. Are there vestigial organs? Uh, these are supposedly relics of the evolutionary past. If evolution was true, we would have so many vestigial organs, and yet no one can point to a clear example because it's been discovered uh, right back in 1999. Um, it was stated that we found that uh, the appendix has a function in the immune 
system it, it, in young people it's quite important better to have the um, appendix than not have it so this was thought to be a vestigial organ but it's shown not to be one i think this is the final question are we just four percent different to chimpanzees this is the claimed uh, genome difference First of all, it's worth pointing out that that 4% figure is disputed. Some people say if you look closely at the genome, it's more like 11%. But whether it's 4% or 11%, the answer to that question is no. Humans are completely different in many respects. In this talk, I've, meant, I've shown how our hands are completely different. Our feet, our face, our language, our brains are completely different. They're not 4% different. They're not 11% different. They are completely different uh, to that of apes. And it's worth noting that the genome is not necessarily a good way to compare design. People have said, scientists have said, humans share 50% genome with bananas. Well, that shows you that, uh, that there's, there's only limited usefulness in comparing genome when you're comparing design. So why is this important? I want to come back to the importance of a worldview because the biblical worldview is so positive. Uh, for you have made man a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honour. If you know God through the Lord Jesus Christ, you can appreciate this verse. You have the joy of a hope of heaven. You have the joy of knowledge of God. You have the joy of knowing that man is truly special and God loves man. That is so different to the evolutionary worldview that man is not special at all. This is the kind of thing we read in the secular world. Professor Peter Atkins, we are just a bit of slime on a planet. According to evolution, man is not special. He's just at best a speck of dust on a speck of dust. At worst, just a bit of slime on a planet. No wonder so many people suffer from depression today because this worldview is so negative, it's so damaging. What a contrast between the biblical worldview and the evolutionary worldview. So you see the importance of this topic, the origin and design of man. One of the great advantages of understanding biblical creation is you see the purpose of man's unique design. It makes sense that man is uniquely upright means we can be stewards of creation to look after the animals um, no th there isn't any mammal that can stand up to us god didn't want an ape to stand up to us only humans stand up we can be stewards man gave us skill in our hands to subdue the earth he gave us uh, wisdom in our brains and understanding to subdue the earth he gave us that intelligence that we might understand God's word, understand the gospel, understand God's righteousness, understand God's grace. And he's also designed us for fellowship with his creator. Uh, our design is so underused, our brains are underused until we come to know God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So just to summarize, True science supports the Bible. That's what I found in my own lab. That's what I've found doing work myself on human hands and other parts of the human body. And man is physically unique from head to toe, from our big toe right to the top of our head. There are unique features. Most importantly, man is a unique spiritual being. I've met so many colleagues in academia those who are agnostic, not religious, and they, I can see they agree that there's something different about man. Man is a spiritual being. And man is over-designed with respect to survival, over-designed in a positive, purposeful way. Uh, we are designed for far more than survival, far more than just reproducing, far more than just eating and playing sport. We are designed for eternity designed to know God and to enjoy him uh, forever. And just to make a final point, Adam was a real person. We are all related to 
Adam. It must have been amazing when God created Adam. And Adam was perfect, but it must have been so sad when Adam sinned. And all of us have inherited that sin. But the Bible tells us the good news that there is a new Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, many will be made righteous. And I hope that applies to you too. As well as the book, The Design and Origin of Man, and the booklet in God's image, I've written various other books, uh, but also have a DVD on the uniqueness of man, uh, published through Answers in Genesis. So you're very welcome uh, to look at those things. Um, thank you very much. And I hope that was a help and an encouragement. Thank you.